looking at Bariloche. It's very easy to think that this is just a beautiful place full of beautiful people. But the city holds a seriously dark secret. Hundreds of Nazis came here at the end of World War II. Senior SS generals, Auschwitz's angel of death, and more than likely, the leader of the Third Reich, Adolf Hitler himself. He could have found refuge here and stayed in this place, at the Anelko House. We better not go there, you know? Uh, I don't know. Well, I think, well, I think we will go there. Evidence keeps stacking up that this would have been a route Hitler would have taken had he fled. 21-year CIA veteran Bob Baer and war crimes investigator John Sensich have used the recently declassified FBI files to determine that Hitler could have escaped Germany bound for Spain, boarded a U-boat in the Spanish port town of Vigo, then arrived off the coast of Argentina three months later. Hitler could have left Vigo, Spain. And what we have in Argentina is a team that's looking for the possibility there's a scuttled U-boat here. They've been looking for days. We found what we thought could have been a piece of a U-boat, but the weather's coming in, so we need to keep digging. My problem is the distance from Vigo up here down to Argentina in a U-boat. Look at these things. It's not some place you would like to spend a couple weeks underwater. Uh, these are like big coffins. So he needs an intermediate stop, and that would be the Canary Islands off North Africa, which is in a way a no man's land. On the remote Spanish Canary Islands, the team uncovered evidence that certain locals were secretly supporting the Nazis during the war. Is he telling me there was an Enigma machine? Había. And a nearby network of tunnels less than a mile from the sea were rumored to be arming and resupplying German U boats during the war. He's telling me that there was in the island uh, storage for torpedoes, some tunnels. Could a U-boat have been resupplied in the Canary Islands, and could Adolf Hitler have used that location to make his way to South America? Let's get Lenny and Gerard in these tunnels, see what they can find. This whole myth of Spanish neutrality is just blown away for me. Former U.S. Marshals Commander Lenny DePaul and acclaimed investigative journalist Gerard Williams make their way to the network of tunnels rumored to be a Nazi U-boat base that could have aided Hitler in his journey to Argentina. All the intel that we gathered here says the tunnels were specifically built for the Navy. The Navy kept their ammunition here. They kept their torpedoes. There's seven kilometers of tunnels. That, that's enormous. And who supported it? Was it the Germans or was it General Franco? We need to find out either way. Local journalist Javier Duran, the man responsible for exposing the presence of these hidden tunnels, has gotten the team access to the complex. Okay. This is on a completely different scale. Look at the size of this blast door. Yeah, I see. What's that, eight inches of steel? Wow. We're getting past that thing. Yeah, it's solid. And this is, I mean, seriously military engineering from the 40s. What is this? This is a system of ventilation mechanical. This is a ventilation system. El manejo de explosivos de pólvora. These rooms were isolated rooms to manipulate uh, explosives. Here, see the lip? So you're making a proper airtight seal when you close this. Franco and Hitler in conversation about this place so they could protect the island, the Canary Islands? Of course, Hitler was really worried that uh, Allied forces could uh, invade the Canary Islands. So the next strategic point close to Africa and the entrance of Europe is here. Although Spanish dictator Francisco Franco kept his country neutral during World War II, 
He supported the Nazi regime, which helped him rise to power during the Spanish Civil War. In 1940, Franco met with Hitler in Andai, France, to discuss the Nazi leader's secret use of the Canary Islands. It is believed that Franco offered this as a concession for never officially joining the Axis powers. 36-39, the civil war in Spain. Your economy is a complete mess in 39. Something like this costs millions of dollars to build. Who paid for this? Officially, all this was built with uh, Spanish money. Look at this, Joe. Aha! Aha! That's how you carry your torpedoes. There's the hoist. There's the hoist, runs the entire length of the tunnel. Look at that. All the way down. They'll carry a lot of ammunition. In the early 40s, Spain has a really small navy. We've been in a room that could hold hundreds of torpedoes. Well, the only submarines that are in these waters that need torpedoes are Nazi submarines. It just goes on forever. It's an amazing neck. This is just too big for Spain in those days. It's got to be meant for somebody else, or it's got to be meant for Spain and a friend. And we know who that friend is. That friend is Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. Spain didn't have U-boats. They didn't have the, the kind of resources available to build something like this. And clearly, the Germans came in and built this for them. I don't care whose name the title was in, it was a German base. These tunnels, they're far too expensive for the Spanish government, but we don't even have to look at the money. All we have to do is look at common sense. Why would the Spanish government develop an infrastructure for submarines when they don't have any submarines? I think what, what we've established here, to my satisfaction, is that a U-boat could have been taken care of. Now, the question is, what would have happened to Hitler? I mean, we're not talking about he, he landed there for a couple hours, we're talking possibly weeks. They didn't, they didn't move him in one of these tunnels to recuperate in the tunnel, I can tell you that. Hitler was not the Unabomber that lives out in a shack in the forest and turns off the electricity. You're taking somebody who is leading the Third Reich and you have to protect him. What we need to do is spread out from the mere tunnels and look for known associates, I any sort of other infrastructure which could take care of a human being to recuperate from a U-boat. John digs through the declassified files for any mention of key Nazi supporters on the remote Canary Islands. We have a, a document here from the, uh, the OSS of what the OSS are calling obnoxious Germans. This OSS document relates specifically to Gustav Winter. It's not a term we use today, obnoxious, but what they're talking about is somebody on a terrorist watch list. He was a German engineer. In 1930, he moved to the Canary Islands where he built a, a villa. And certain aspects of his villa became a militarized zone under Franco. Well, I mean, look, somebody going down to the Canary Islands, buying or leasing a peninsula, building a villa in World War II. We're talking about it essentially a base. It's a satellite Nazi base. Yeah, there's no other way to put it. Is it a place where Hitler could have received the rest and recuperation that he really needed? Let's get Lenny and Gerard in there. Let's see what they can find. Look at the, the front of the house looks like some sort of an observation tower. After an hour drive through volcanic mountains, the team surveys the 44 acres of land surrounding Villa Winter. You got one road in, one road out. It's an unassolated place. Look how this is built. It's a fortress. They have vantage points on top of these mountains. I've hunted the worst of the worst. I've found them hiding in cabinets, behind trees, in tunnels. I would throw all that in the garbage to have a place like this if I was a fugitive. It's desolate. There's nothing here. Perfect spot for a safe house. A compound like that, there was somebody in that house that I needed to pull out of there. It would be almost impossible for me to get to without anybody knowing I was coming. For a fugitive, it's a fortress. 
perfect place to hide. Uh, here's our first glimpse of the sea. Tim Kennedy, U.S. Army Special Forces, and a team of world-renowned marine archaeologists are following eyewitness testimony, Argentine naval documents, and an FBI report that potentially places a sunken U-boat that shuttled Adolf Hitler to South America in this area. Holy crap. After spending 10 days searching these waters, the team comes head to head with Mother Nature. Crazy. Golly. This is crazy water here. Swells, wind, white caps. It's a sailor's worst nightmare. What, what would happen if we tried to put a boat out there? If the wind comes in this direction, and we, we try to go in like this, you yeah. would just. Can we hit a breaker and come up? Yes, I'm just. Honestly, I don't even think you'd get past the surf. You get one wave over the side, the equipment's gone. More importantly, it's a safety issue for everybody on board. It's just insane to go like this. Yeah. Where we are this time of year, it's getting colder, wind's getting harder, storms are going to be coming in. It's just getting rougher. We're grounded. All right, let's go. You can't do this stuff during the winter, and winter's here. How much further we got to go? Not very much. Lenny DePaul, Gerard Williams, and their local translator make their way towards a property once owned by Gustav Winter, a prominent name on the U.S. government's German watch list. Villa Winters is built on 44 and a half acres of Nazi land. They are in search of any evidence that could point to Hitler using this villa as a rest stop and safe house to break up the grueling 7,000-mile U-boat journey from Europe to South America. Boy, look at this. Like something out of a James Bond novel, you know? This is where the baddies live. Welcome to Villa Winter. The team has been granted access by the property's current owner, a real estate development company who will soon level the villa to make way for a resort. All right, look. See the glass? It's not nice stuff. I have no blueprints, I have nothing. So I have no idea exactly what we'll find here. From that window to the top yeah. roof, that is an electric lantern. Okay. So then it's possible that they could have been using this to signal to U-boats offshore, give them a point of reference, and it's not a difficult idea to think that you could be taken by small boats from those U-boats and until here. What goes on down here? It is very interesting. What was this place used for exactly? A lot of rooms to many people to stay, no? Here can live at least 10 people, all these rooms. It's like a little dormitory. I mean, what's this? What was down here? I don't know. It's very strange. It kind of reminds me of like a medical facility or something, you know, with the tile and, and the way it's set up in here. Yeah, put an operating table in the middle. I mean, there are places where people can recuperate and recover and sleep and stay. This is an amazing safe house. If you've got a high value target, you want to hide it somewhere. It's amazingly secure. So if you're a U-boat captain, it's a great place to aim for. And when people are arriving here exhausted or in need of some sort of medical help, they could rest here while a doctor treats them. This could be used to get high-ranking Nazi officials out of Germany and to safety. Villa Winter, it's perfect if you take somebody like Adolf Hitler, who needs medical treatment, bring him here for however long. 
On top of this, you have a known Nazi living there. I think this is a huge clue. If we look back at the FBI document that relates to Hitler's submarine landing in Argentina, it says the sub came ashore and Hitler, two women, a doctor, disembarked. You have Hitler with serious medical conditions, a medical facility at the Villa Winter. Then Hitler arrived by submarine accompanied by a doctor. It's all aligned. Between the tunnels for the U-boat and this house, this would be the perfect place for Hitler to recuperate on his way to Argentina. Satisfied that it was possible that Hitler used the Canary Islands as a transit point to South America, Bob shifts focus to the other leg of the investigation, the hunt for a scuttled German U-boat. Now we've got this team down in Argentina, which is run in a roadblock, and that's the weather. It's the winters coming on. But I think what we really need to do is push on the investigation, at least for this winter. I agree. I'm convinced there's a U-boat out there. I want to come back when the weather's better and find that damn thing. In the meantime, the evidence for Hitler landing in Argentina is very strong. Earlier in the investigation, the team on the ground in South America followed an FBI file placing Hitler unloading from a U-boat near the Argentine port town of San Antonio Oeste. They uncovered eyewitness testimony. She claims that from her kitchen window, she saw the submarine. A local Argentine naval file of a mysterious German U-boat. What happened to the sub? I don't know. And a Nazi kingpin, Geraldo Lausen, operating in the area. I'm firmly confident that Hitler very well could have landed in San Antonio West Day. The question is, where did he go next? He's not going to sit here where he got off the U-boat, especially if it was scuttled. There's too much risk. If we go to some of these other documents, one, uh, an FBI document indicating that once this U-boat arrives in Argentina, there's a trip inland towards the foothills of the southern Andes. The party arrived at the ranch where Hitler and his party are now hiding. Another document I have here is stating that Hitler is living in an immense German estate in Patagonia. So according to multiple sources, Hitler was moving inland. Well, it's Patagonia, they're going for the mountains, they're going for a remote area. So what we're looking for is German communities. And if you keep going across South America, you will come to San Carlos de Bariloche. Bariloche is the Berlin of Argentina. Bariloche has long been known as an epicenter for fleeing Nazi war criminals. Nazi intelligence officer Reinhard Kops wanted for crimes against humanity, died at 86 in Bariloche. And Eric Pribka, captain of the SS police force and the leader of the massacre of 325 Italians, lived openly as a school teacher until his capture made international news in 1995. This isn't the kind of place where you have to hide out. The German community there goes way back. It's rooted there. It's the kind of colony that Hitler could feel comfortable protected. We're only going to get one shot at it. Some of the people in this area, even today, are not friendly to outsiders. If that report's right, that we're looking for an immense German-owned estate, Bari Loche is a good place to start. Absolutely. We need to get people out there right now. Let's see what we can find. After World War II, up towards 48, I mean, this place became Nazi central. Following declassified reports of Hitler living in Patagonia on an immense German-owned estate, Tim Kennedy and Gerard Williams begin their investigation of Bariloche, a remote village tucked between the border of Argentina and Chile that has long been a stronghold for Nazis on the run. This place is isolated, it's remote, there's no access. It was protected from the rest of the world. You don't even realize all the hidden secrets that are here. They are joined by J.P. Cervantes, a Green Beret who has spent his career protecting high-value targets. Bob has added him to the team to help navigate this tight-knit German community. This is not my first time in Bariloche. I was here before training with the Argentine military. 
according to them, back in the 40s, their primary mission was to hard SS officers that were here. Not only support hiding, but actually protecting it. If you're not from here, they will not tell you anything about it. You just don't come into Bariloche and start asking questions about Nazi. Hundreds of Nazis came here at the end of World War II. So this really is a place of security. This is a refuge. It may all be chocolate shops, Bavarian buildings, but most of these will hide a secret. And that secret, after 70 years, needs to be told. The team devises a plan to investigate Bariloche. Let's say 1600, meet back here. All right, guys, take care. Gerard will dig into potential locations of the immense German-owned estate cited in the declassified files. Much discussions. Tim and JP investigate Bariloche's points of entry and exit to gather information on how a target as high value as Hitler could have been inserted into this community. In Special Forces, I help people get from one point to another. First thing I gotta look is, I gotta look at all the ports of entry. How am I gonna get transportation in here? So if I wanna move somebody here, of course, I'm gonna use the rail line. You know how a lot of train stations are like in the middle of the town? Yeah. This one is in the outskirts. It's isolated, it's private. If I was gonna be wanting to move somebody in and out, this is how you'd want the, the train to be located. So according to this, the first train that came to Bariloche was in 1934. This has been operational for 11 years before Hitler's escape. To determine how Hitler could have successfully moved to Bariloche from his last suspected location, unloading from a U-boat in San Antonio Oeste 400 miles away, Tim and JP questioned the train station master. Does this track go all the way to San Antonio Oeste? Eh, estas vías van hasta el océano, hasta San Antonio Oeste. Hasta San Antonio Oeste, sí. Sí? That line has run since 1934. Y nunca paró, eh? Were there any private trains, like people that shipped their cargo using their own trains or any private boxes? As soon as I hear the word Laosen, I have in my head Laosen from San Antonio Oeste. Earlier in the investigation, FBI files led the team to Geraldo Laosen, a wealthy German operating a wool empire in Argentina. Lawson is the central figure in San Antonio Oeste. This is a guy who could do anything he wanted. Hitler have to have somebody like a Lawson. Lawson had been moving wool and people from San Antonio Oeste to Bariloche. All of these dots were absolutely unequivocally supporting each other. Gerard prepares to meet with a local expert on the architecture of Bariloche. He has information on a location that may match the declassified file's description of an immense German estate in the area, a mysterious property known as the Analco House. What can you tell me about the house? Well, the Analco House is like, it's kind of a mystery. Everybody talks about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was pointed many times as being a place of uh, Nazi meetings. And the legends tells about the whole thing with the Hitler's house. You know, it's it's a kind of a creepy place. For decades, local rumors have swirled that Hitler himself once took refuge in this remote mansion. The Analco House sits miles from civilization and would have only been accessible by the lake it is situated on. 450 acres of dense forest on three sides and two islands just offshore make it completely hidden from public view. So is it possible to get onto the land to see the house? Well, it's very, very difficult. There's nobody, it's not you can call a real estate agent that will show you the place or, or get to the manager, it's like, uh, a secrecy around it, you know? The actual location of the house is kind of weird because there weren't even roads, any kind of roads there, you know? You will be trespassing, so... We better not go there, you know? Okay. okay. Uh, I don't know. Well, I think, we, I think we will go there. I've been doing this story for over 10 years now. 
a story like this, people are covering up all over the place. And it's actually quite hard work trying to find out what those secrets are and why they're a secret. It's really, really difficult. Isn't it? We'll go and have a look anyway. So this is the knuckle house. Got it. Tim Kennedy, Gerard Williams, and J.P. Cervantes, a Green Beret and expert on military operations in Bariloche, go over the intel from the nearby Analco house, which could be the immense German estate the declassified files place Hitler in months after he was believed dead. The lot is bought in 1940 by um, Jorge Antonio, who's the head of Mercedes-Benz in Argentina. Funny enough, also one of the top Nazis here. The property itself is finished in 45 and then it simply goes quiet for a decade. So, 1945, a super rich German, part of the Nazi party, owns this property. Yeah. You know, we're not talking about a small property, we're talking a mansion 40 miles away from anywhere, with a large farm behind it, which makes them pretty much self-sufficient. You know, in Afghanistan, like Bin Laden, one of the very unique things about his mansion was that it was entirely self-sufficient in regards to him not needing ever to leave it. This seems to replicate that. If I'm gonna hide a high value target, this is perfect. So how do we get in here? That's the big question. This is not gonna be easy in terms of any legal access to it at all. This is a green brace. Like we go into places behind enemy lines all the time. It's all about having to plan and executing that plan without being detected. All right, we can't gain access from the road. I, I think one of the clearest ways to get there is to go by the beach. Okay. We do have to be aware that if there is a caretaker there, we are in Argentina. I know you guys are used to guns around, but he may well be carrying a weapon of some sort. So, so we don't, well, I'm, I'm, I'm so saying we don't want to get a boat way too close to the house. How about we keep the boat away from the beach, but close enough for you to make a swim there? All right. So. We have Island 1, which is a big island. Let's see Island 2. My recommendation is you and I on a boat, just fishermen, cruising around, right? Fishing good spots on the back side of this island. Now, line of sight from the house, line of sight is difficult to see anything yeah, yeah, going yeah, through yeah, there. Yeah. I slip into the water and do a surface swim and try to get some photos, slip out of the water, take a camera, and get out of town. I'm trying to understand how feasible it is for this house to hide Hitler. JP and I, we go and assess locations to see if it's suitable for a high value target all the time. I'm thinking about security measures, about a defense plan, any safe rooms, places to hide him. There's a lot of factors that we have to investigate. We have to get on here, we can't be compromised. With the help of a hired fishing boat, JP and Tim make their way to a property the FBI files suggest may have been a hideout for Adolf Hitler. So the house should be tucked away a little bit. There it is. I saw something. Can you turn around? Right there. Over there? Yeah, over here. It's like a little guard shack. If you put a machine gun right there, you can cover this entire body of water yeah. and nothing can get through, right? The distance, the high ground, that's perfect angle. You can have grazing fire and you can cover more terrain from there. If we have someone like Hitler hiding in this house, you start looking at how you're gonna control the access and monitor any traffic that is on the lake. You want a guard would give him early warning. That guard post is a perfect place to do it. Let's go a little bit to the left here, to the island. The team heads between the islands to shield them as they prepare to infiltrate the property. We just gotta see if anybody's in there first and then we'll, we'll see how, how far we can push the pocket. I'll be watching. I got your back all the way from the boat. Yeah. 
Army Special Forces, our patch boasts our capability to land, sea, and air. All right, we're 50 meters away, Tim. Any way to get to our objective area, we can get there. Go. People have this weird perception of what being stealth is all about. What it's really about is being the slowest thing out there. JP, comms check. Read you loud and clear. All set. I'm gonna move up to this first building, see if I can uh, get a vantage point where I can see the house without uh, kind of giving myself away. Roger, be careful. We have to be very careful in how we approach this. You know, we're not in combat. Rules of engagement are completely different. If we get shot out of here, we can't shoot back. We got eyes on the house. Road, you're dead. Doesn't look like there's any activity here at the house. There's no smoke, there's no lights on, all the doors look buttoned up. Yeah, I don't see anything from my side either. I mean, it looks like nobody's been here. Go ahead and send the crew. We'll be clear to come in, guys. Roger. With no signs of the caretaker of the property, a single cameraman joins Tim on the shore of the Analco house. The house, it's gigantic. There's three chimneys here, two doors. About 15 to 17 windows. To build something like this in the 40s, you have to boat in every single piece. It's crazy. These people were powerful, rich, and they wanted privacy. I'm on the lake side of the house. I know. I got eyes on you. Now I'm going to try to do a little bit more recon. Roger. I'll be standing by. We obviously, we got a dock here for boats, but. I can't even figure out what this is. This thing is crazy sturdy. You know, these beams right here, they're like raised up. Then in between them, you have a whole bunch of super thick, I mean, those are like four inch thick boards. JP, is Tim. Yeah, I found what I think is a ramp for a seaplane. Coming right up to the front of this property. This location is completely secluded. But if you're isolated like this, you're gonna come in by boat. It's vulnerable. Everything can see you. But seaplane access is different. It's perfect for a high value target. You know, you can hook a winch up right there and pull the seaplane in. And the construction of this ramp is so solid. Stop, stop, stop. I got movement, I got somebody coming. I got movement, I got somebody coming out of the house. He's walking towards you. While investigating the Analco house, which declassified files suggest could have been a hiding place for Adolf Hitler, Tim Kennedy discovers the property is not as vacant as it seems. Can you see what he's doing? Hey, Tim, it seems like he went back inside the house. I don't see movement, so you should be good to go. Uh, just hop in the water and we're calling Red Blue. Knowing the caretaker may come back any minute, Tim and the cameraman withdraw from the beach. The reconnaissance of the Inalco house was partially successful. We have a ton of photos, but there are still significant questions about this house that need to be answered. Go. Anybody that mans that guard tower with a machine gun can, can protect the entire point of entry or exit. John Sensich and Bob Baer analyzed the intel collected by Tim Kennedy on his reconnaissance mission of the Analco house. This is self-contained, out in the middle of nowhere, and having seaplanes come in 
tells me that they had visitors that they didn't want seen. There's no other explanation. People who have guard towers or heads of state or wanted criminals, you simply do not need guard towers unless something else is going on in the property. Bob and John have tracked down architectural drawings of the Analco property. This is the house facing, going in that direction is the same as the front here. Yeah, it's facing the lake. Further back here, probably a flower garden, and then there's another structure back here. Which looks like a house to me. Normally in places like this, if you have a guest house, you put it off to the side. Or if it's servant's quarters, you put it far away from the house. Why would you, on an absolutely gorgeous lake like this, take a structure and put it behind another one? If it's directly behind the principal residence, it can't be seen from the lake. And if it can't be seen from the lake, it can't be seen from anywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's just a principle of a safe house. You do not want to see activity. I think this house is flashing red. And now on top of it, we have a hidden house. What in God's name is going on here? We have to get in there and, and figure out what this house is about. Tim's already had a potential confrontation with a caretaker. That's our, our biggest concern. We, we cannot send a whole crew in there. We're just, we're going to be caught. I think we need to send in only one person to minimize the risk. And that's Cervantes. I mean, he's been down there, he speaks Spanish. Let's do this incrementally. First thing we should do is send in initial reconnaissance. See if the caretaker or if there's any other security personnel in the area. Then fly a drone over the place. We have to absolutely see what is in that rear house, what it was for. Let's see what they can find. J.P. Cervantes returns to the Analco house to stake out the property and plan his approach. Looks clear on the left side. But as I was observing today, that I was there for hours. I don't see any movement. So I decide to approach the house. I go into another beach one kilometer away from the house. Lentecito, lentecito. Perfecto, Nacho. To mask my movement from the house. JP uses the state-of-the-art surveillance drone equipped with a high-resolution camera to investigate the unknown structure that the team identified on the Analco blueprints. This drone is an amazing system. We can see everything you want. I'm more interested in what's in the back, where that other building is supposed to be. That is very interesting, huh? I am looking at the ground. There's supposed to be a house or a structure here. Nothing out there. That's a surprise. There's something strange here. To investigate the ground where this unknown structure was believed to have been located, JP uses the cover of the forest to circle around to the back of the property. Some kind of ventilation shaft. What is even more weird is that it's away from the house. You know, it's like hiding here. Air is going somewhere. Obviously, it's underground. Uh, I would love to know what's down there. Hey, what do you make of this, man? Check it out. This really caught my attention. I mean, that looks to me to be a vent. Tim Kennedy and Green Beret J.P. Cervantes review the images from their successful reconnaissance mission of the Analco House, the location that declassified files could place Hitler living months after he was believed dead. Where did you come across this vent? I don't, let me pull it up. That's the back. There's supposed to be a house right here. Yeah, I didn't see anything. See this? So if that's like sunk, you know, is that maybe a collapsed subterranean area? I mean, anytime you have a principal, you're always going to have that safe room, right? It's going to be defensible. Right. Putting a guy in a bunker underneath a house like this, he could be perfectly safe and secure. Yeah. 
If there is ventilation shafts, there has to be some hidden bunker there. We have to go back and do our due diligence to research and investigate this location. We, we have something we need to go put ground proof on, have to put our eyes on it, need to figure out what it is. Under the cover of darkness, Tim and JP return to the Analco house to investigate the air vent they suspect could lead to a potential subterranean bunker. Man, I think it's just a little bit here. They use a low spectrum red light to decrease their chances of detection. It registers at a tenth of the intensity of white light to the human eye at night. Let, let me take point. Okay. Somewhere over here, keep your eyes open to the left. Here we go, right here. See it? Right there? Yeah, got it. Let me go ahead and get the snake out. This microfiber optic camera is less than an inch in diameter and equipped with a 100-foot cable, allowing them to look through the grates of the air vent to uncover what may lie in the darkness deep below. It's like a small camera at the end of a lens that has uh, its own light source. You can bend it and get it up inside of crevices, nooks, crannies, under doors. In this case, down uh, what we think is a ventilation pipe. And we are connected. I'm in. There we go, now. Are you getting that? Yeah, I see it. See that? Yeah, looks like there's a piece of metal support going across, you know, maybe a rebar. This is solid rebar. Why the hell do you have three quarter inch thick rebar out in the middle of nowhere? I think I'm at the bottom, Tim. This absolutely is something significant structure, maybe even a subterranean hidden bunker. It looks like rubble down there. It, it looks like it's been either collapsed or destroyed. Whoever lived there, they're trying to cover their tracks. Next time on Hunting Hitler. She had some serious money, a lot of money. And most importantly, she was a Nazi. Can she remember how long Hitler stays in Mafalda? Between nine and 10 days after the Second World War. It's confirmation that Hitler didn't die in the bunker in 1945. Are you aware of anything planned into the hotel to protect important people? Tunnels. If we find evidence that there were tunnels here, Hitler really could have operated out of this hotel. Stop it, just fell in. 1947 comes along and all of a sudden, Hitler is back on the radar. I have nothing. I have something right here. Turning a page and seeing the exact words that are in an FBI file takes your breath away for a second. Yeah, it's definitely it. He was here. There's not sufficient evidence that Hitler died in the bunker on April 30th, 1945. Could Adolf Hitler have gotten out of Berlin and how did he do it? How did he enter Argentina? We're gonna look at who could facilitate hiding Hitler.